Father, I thank you that we're, we're not here to play any sort of religious games. We're not here just to learn some systems and some protocols and, and be at another thing with a bunch of other Christians. Lord, we desperately need you. As we meet right now, there are people dying without you. That without you, Lord, they're never going to know what it means to be free, what it means to be loved, what it means to be whole. So God, I pray you would breathe on this. Even now, as I pray, may you lift the head of the discouraged in this room. May you heal the bodies of the sick. May you put vision back in people that hadn't had it for too long. God, we desperately need you. We need you now, Jesus, more than we ever have. And Lord, I pray you'd have your way. Speak to people. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for what you've done. We could be so many places this morning, but we're here. And we're grateful for it. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Hold on. Five seconds of clapping or praise or dance or whatever you do. Not bad. Not bad. Not bad. Can you give somebody a, a worship together hug, which is at least five seconds or longer? I got in at exactly 3.30 a.m. It's incredible. Just glad I made it. Do you like who you're sitting next to? <laughs> you're stuck for at least another hour, so make it work. My clock has already started. Demonic clocks all over the church in America. Can I preach right at you? And feel free to be loud. You can talk back. You can sit there however you feel comfortable. But it is more fun in church when you talk to people who look like they want to be there. Our church is right in the heart of Manhattan. And uh, man, every Sunday you look out and see some very interesting things. You can, yeah, I'll leave it at that. I'm getting better. That's the title of this uh, conversation we're about to have. I'm getting better. A couple years ago, I, I, I started to talk to my wife about what changed our life the most, what helped us get through it as we've followed Jesus for a long time. I'm, I'm 41, been married for 16 years, and, and we were, yeah, thank you, yeah, 16 years. It's incredible. Marriage is not easy. It's just awesome. And uh, we, we were talking about this concept about how you know we felt like we've gotten better and how lost the topic of what I'm gonna talk about really is. And I felt like God put it on my heart for the foreseeable future until he tells me otherwise to preach on this, this one topic. And I've, I've done it here and there in our own church and other places. And I feel like um, hopefully today that God has something for you, but I, I don't know anybody that doesn't wanna get better. Like rarely do you meet people who are just like, I don't want to get better, except for people who go on that week of spring break, co young college kids, they wake up and make a decision to get worse. But everybody else, I think everybody, even, even outside of people who know Jesus, people want to get better. We want our lives to get better. We want our testimony to get better. We want our voice to get better. We want our gift to get better. I don't know anybody who doesn't want to get better. But there comes a point where you reach the end of yourself and you don't know what to do to get better. So your identity becomes locked in what you think you should be and what you think you should be doing rather than the best identity moment ever is to realize that in Jesus, we will always be in this state of under construction. I'm getting better. That's who I am. I'm getting better because God saved me and he's not done yet. So every day I hope that I get a little bit better. But I meet people all the time who are like, I want to change, but I don't know how. Who's ever felt like that? Oh, really? 20% of you? So the rest of y'all are just awesome. You will come across people who want to get better, but we don't know how. Going to church will not do it. Listening to incredible worship music alone will not do it. There has to be something more. And I'm going to highlight that today, and you can take it for what it is. And I'm going to read you a little bit of the Bible, just one passage, if that's all right. Anybody care? I want you to turn to the book of Leviticus. We're going to read the whole thing aloud. John chapter 16. 
And the premise is Jesus talking. How are you guys doing up there in the fancy seats? Incredible. Seats of judgment up there, looking down. The premise of this is Jesus sensing that his uh, disciples, the people that are with him, are, are pretty weary about the fact that he might go. They can sense he's not going to be around that much longer. And he says something that's so profound where if you don't know your Bible, it can almost sound like it's heresy. But he says something so explosive and I think so under talked about that it's an awesome thing to bring to the surface again and again. And he says this, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Imagine that walking around with Jesus and he looks at you and says, it's to your advantage that I go. It's to your advantage that I leave for if I don't go away, the helper will not come to you. But when I go, I'm going to send him to you. And when he comes, he's going to convict the world about sin, about righteousness, about judgment concerning sin, because they don't believe in me concerning righteousness, because I'm going to the father and you will no longer see me and concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Come on, somebody, you can shout me down right there because that's a big deal. No. OK, fine. I still have much more to tell you, but you can't handle it right now. But when the spirit of truth comes. He will guide you into all truth. He's not going to speak on his own, but whatever he hears, he will tell you and he will declare it to you, the things that are to come. And he will glorify me because he will take from what is mine and he will declare it to you. Everything that the father has is mine. For this reason, I said the spirit will take from what is mine and declare it to you. I don't know about you, but if Jesus said something is an advantage, I want to pay attention to what it is. And I don't know about you, but I'll tell you this. If you want to continue to get better, here's what I propose today. You have to make a fresh decision to live Holy Spirit led and Holy Spirit fed every single day of your life. The Holy Spirit is not a concept. It is not a theory to be dissected. We believe the Holy Spirit. He is the chain breaker. He is the anointing maker. He is the way maker. He is the one that opens up eyes that want to stay shut. The Holy Spirit is the one that will breathe on an ordinary song and have it penetrate the hearts of people who don't even want to listen to it. The Holy Spirit is the one that picks you up when you don't want to walk any further ever again. This is our advantage. Do you know him? When you make a decision, to say, Lord, I want to live completely Holy Spirit led, Holy Spirit fed. It's an advantage like nothing on this earth. You don't have to, though. But what you're going to be left with is a Christianity where you're trying to live out a supernatural salvation on your own natural power. Good luck with that. Good luck trying to stay sexually pure on your own. How's that working out? It got real quiet. Good luck. Good luck loving your neighbor that hates you on your natural power. Good luck writing music that is going to penetrate the hearts of people that are anti God before they met you. Good luck trying to do all the stuff that God has called us to do on your own natural power. My question is, why would you want to? If there is a better way, if the Holy Spirit has illuminated a path that makes it easier for us to get to know Jesus better, why would we not take it? Have you ever met people that just do things that are difficult and you don't know why? Like they just make things harder than they need to be. Anybody seen somebody like that? Anybody sit next to a person like that? Anybody married to a person like that? By the way, how many married people do we have in here? And that's why there's not that much desperation. You know, if you go to a worship conference and it's like 90% single, I mean, people are just abandoned in worship. Here it's like, we're good. I mean, we're mostly good. My son and I, I got three kids. Like I said, my son, Roman, we have this exercise at airports that we love because you know how in the airport they have those, what we call, we call them Holy Spirit walkways where they're like that bouncy material and they go about five steps faster than everybody walking. And every time me and my son get on there, we have a little party. We just get on there and you know, we bounce around and we look at everybody. And Roman always says the same thing. He goes, Dad, why doesn't everybody get on the Holy Spirit walkway? And we'll look to our left and to our right and you see people that have all their bags and all their children 
And oh, some of them look like they're demonic children. Everybody's freaking out. They're dropping bags everywhere. And you just look at people. And it's funny because we're going to the same terminal. We have to be at the same place. But if, apparently nobody has told these people that you don't get any extra points for carrying all your bags and losing your testimony on your way to the terminal. Here, me and Roman, we're not special. We're not better than them. We're not different than them. We just found out some information that if we walk on this thing, we're going to get where we're going. Same place as you, but we're going to get there a little bit lighter. We're going to get there a little bit happier. And I don't know if these people know it or not, but never in the history of airports have you gotten to the gate and looked at the gate agent and, and, and she's like, you know what? It looks like you worked harder to get here. I'm going to change your seat. Never. You're going to get to the same seat. Why on earth would you make it harder than it has to be? This is a picture of church in America where you have people that think you get points for looking miserable. You think you get better Christian like status if you're mad and you're sad and you're weighed down because of the weight of the cross that you are carrying. When Jesus said, the helper is on the way the moment you cry out, the moment you lay your burdens down, maybe the Holy Spirit is trying to lift the heads of many saying, what are you striving for? Why are you still trying to carry all this on your own back when the Holy Spirit has lit up a better way for you? Will you look at the advantage again today? That is my plea right there. Normally people clap. We're not going to do it here, but it's fine. Because it just means let it be. Yep, that could be for me. Maybe I've been carrying this a little bit too heavy. I wonder in, in, in your life, I've been there a few times. But I got to remind myself often of who we are. I got to remind myself almost every day, especially in a crazy city like New York. I'm a Holy Spirit led, Holy Spirit fed believer. I believe it all. I believe that God has gifted us. I believe that he can break chains. I believe he can open up eyes. I believe he can breathe on ordinary, regular, flawed people like us and use us to bring people closer to him. That's what I believe. The Holy Spirit can do that. Come on, somebody. Maybe you need to remind yourself of that. I think this, you can write this down if you're taking notes. You don't have to, but realize when preachers say that and you don't do it, they're judging you on the inside. I believe the next chapter of revival in our country, who, who's up for that? Who wants to see a, I believe it's going to start with a renewed passion to get to know the Holy Spirit. A renewed passion to get to know the Holy Spirit. I'm not talking about vaguely. I'm not talking about like when you kind of dodge the question when you're around other Christians because no one really wants to say the truth, which is unfortunate. Like most scholars say that the Holy Spirit is a forgotten member of the Trinity. Can you imagine that? Here Jesus is saying, I'm going to go and the Holy Spirit's going to come and it's going to be better. But yeah, we kind of float around this subject. I looked at my wife. We were in church one night and I just said, you know what I love about our church? It's the stuff that happens outside of all the church stuff. When the preaching is done and when our worship sets are over and you just feel that presence of God and you see people who you've been trying to change with your words for years, but yet in the blink of an eye, the Holy Spirit pulls scales off of people's eyes. People who have felt like they've been locked out their whole lives and they walk into a church where the Holy Spirit is absolutely prominent. And things that you've been working for for years, it seems like with no fruit, all of a sudden in the blink of an eye, I said, thank God for the Holy Spirit. We need to talk about him more. I talked to somebody in my church the other day. They were going through some stuff. And I said, by the way, you know, have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? And they said, baptized in the what? I said, how long have you been in our church? He said, oh, about seven months. I said, nobody's told you about the Holy Spirit. He's like, no. I'm like, who's the pastor around here? Because you know, we leave this for a class or some random discussion when maybe it's the primary way we can get people to abandon all that they know so that God can rewrite who they are on their heart. Here's three quick facts about the Trinity. Can I give these to you real quick? I don't have a lot of time, but I'm going to get as much of this in as I can. Just three quick facts. And some of you are going to be like, I know this stuff. You really need to hear it. And then some of you, maybe you haven't heard it like this. And these are just three quick things I, I believe build a foundation 
for us to understand how to use this advantage. Number one, the three, when it comes to the Trinity, by the way, the Trinity, is that word's not in the Bible, but the word Bible isn't in the Bible, and they're both okay to use. The Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The three are equal, yet they are distinctly different. This is important to know because this doesn't create confusion. It creates this amazing already picture of unity in diversity. God loves people so much, he gives three avenues for people to know him better. That's why you don't have to worry about who you're praying to. I I talk to Christians who are so analytical, they they have anxiety about that. Like, am I too Jesus-centric in the summer? Have I not acknowledged God, you know, in the, in the February months? Like, what if I'm just talking to, you know, the Holy Spirit? And I just say, the point is this. You get to talk to heaven. Three are equal, distinctly different. Number two, there is direct access to all three. You have a direct line to heaven. The men and women of God in ministry don't have a hotline that you don't have. You have a direct line direct access to all three why is this important because we still have people that have carried in a little bit of catholic theology a little bit of bad christianity and you end up in churches like ours and people still think they got to go talk to somebody else to contact heaven man i got to call a pastor i got to go to a conference i got to talk to somebody who's holier than me oh my gosh it is a lie from the pit of hell You have direct access to God Almighty. You can cry out to the name of Jesus and see demons run because of it. You can say, Holy Spirit, I need you now. That's your right. And I was in the intensive care unit a couple couple weeks ago. Somebody in our church was, you know, really struggling medically. And I was in the hospital room with a bunch of um, his family. And I was next to a woman. I was praying with our team. and, And there was this awesome lady in there as well. And she was praying, or I think she was trying to pray, and she had these, these beads, these Catholic beads. And uh, I could see that she was frustrated. And I looked at her, I said, are you good? Are you? She's like, are you praying? And I was like, yeah, are you praying? She's like, I'm trying. I just can't remember you know, how many on the left and how many on the right. We, can, can you, I, I don't know what to do. And I said, I, I get that. I said, I think your heart is incredible. And she said, do you have a method of prayer? I said, yeah. She said, how does it go? I said, you ready? It goes like this, help, help! Lord, help, help, now, Jesus, Holy Spirit, I need you now. And she, she looks at me and she goes, you can do that? I said, I don't know if you know this or not, but God is not impressed by your fancy words. He created words. God is not encouraged by your awesome mantra and your declaration. God wants to hear your heart. And when it comes to praying, knowing that the Holy Spirit hears your heart, nothing like it so if you've ever felt like somebody else has more access than you do to heaven you're wrong you're just as anointed you're just as gifted you have just as much uh, grace to hear from heaven as anybody else and number three the Holy Spirit is responsible for regeneration through sanctification which leads to identification aka he teaches you about you whether you want to hear it or not. So the Holy Spirit, his job is to recreate your identity. His job is to convict you of your sin. All those racist mindsets you didn't know you had. All that old bitterness that you thought you were over. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict you, not condemn you. Condemnation brings your head down. Conviction picks your eyes up. We don't like to talk about that. We like to talk to, about the Holy Spirit being our comforter, which he is, but he is also the convictor of our souls. But we don't talk about the Holy Spirit. We can't figure out why Christians are carrying around this baggage for years. Well, we got people who can lead worship, but they can't lead their own life. Well, I don't mean to say that too loud in a room full of worship leaders. But if the Holy Spirit is responsible for regeneration, Through sanctification, which is the fancy word for you getting your life right, whether you like it or not, because God loves you that much to even confront you about you. We should get to know the Holy Spirit better. Can someone say amen if you hear me right now? I think here's a really clear way to break this down. God the Father, he initiates. Let there be light. God the Son, he declares, I am the light of the world. God the Holy Spirit, he executes continually bringing light to all areas. 
Why am I doing all this? Because it's one thing to know it. It's another thing for you to be able to go teach it to somebody. Could change somebody's life. And I, in being in New York, I remember trying to explain this to a friend, and he's like, Carl, I don't, I don't get this. I really want to understand it. It's funny that when you pastor a church, you stop preaching things that sound great, and you desire the Holy Spirit to give you something that helps somebody. <laughs> but I sat there with him, and he, was, he is what I like to call a, um, a street pharmaceutical rep. <laughs> he told me one time, hey, I, I wouldn't even go to that story. But we're sitting there. And I said, okay, let me try to break this down for you. He's like, I get it because God's here and Jesus is here. And now the Holy Spirit's here. And he's like, it's just confusing to me. And at this time, uh, the TV show Narcos just came out. And I know none of y'all have ever seen that because you're way too holy. Uh, but it was a show about basically from top to bottom, a drug operation. It broke down how it all happens. I looked at him. I said, let me break it down for you like this. You know how in Narcos, all that stuff. He's like, yeah, I love Narcos. I'm like, okay, well, God, he is the kingpin. He's the cartel more product than you know even what to do with. Jesus is the kingpin, the drug kingpin. Everybody knows his name. Some people fear him. Other people love him, but everybody knows him. He's like, oh, I get it. I said, you know, the Holy Spirit, he's like that Brooklyn drug dealer. He's at the corner of every school. He's at the corner of every mall. Whatever you need, whenever you need it, it's amazing how those guys are always right there. He's like, I get it. And maybe you need to get it again because it's one thing to know that God can do all this in my life. And Jesus, he died for my sins. But it's a whole other thing to understand that the Holy Spirit is here now to give you faith when you need it, to give you hope when you lose it, to give you passion when you feel discouraged, to give you faith to believe that the best is yet to come, even when what you see doesn't match what you are believing for. I know this for sure. All I know about the Holy Spirit is this. You do not want to get caught in a situation that requires you to be filled, but you show up empty. Maybe you've been there before where you know God has put you in a situation and he's required you to be filled with the Holy Spirit, but you show up empty. You ever felt like that before? I never want to be there again. I remember a couple years ago, I got a call from a, a woman in, in our church and she said, uh, Carl, I need you to come over to our house with some guys because my husband is in trouble. And her husband had fought, I think, three tours fighting for our country overseas. And he'd been through a lot over there. And I knew that he was struggling with some things. And, but she said, no, nah, this is different. I need you to get over here. He's on the back porch. And there are sounds coming out of his mouth that I don't recognize. And I'm scared. I'm hiding in the closet with our children. And I remember hearing it. And I could hear through the phone sounds and some of y'all who have ever dealt with people that are dealing with stuff like this you already know in your heart what kind of sounds I would have heard and I remember I got in the car with two of my friends and we pulled up to the house and as we pulled up you could hear him yelling from this back porch and we went up to the fence and I looked at my two friends I looked at my one friend I said bro you ready we're gonna go pray you ready he goes I woke up hoping something like this was gonna happen today so ready. I got a scripture. I got a word in my heart. Like I, 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 I looked at my other friend. I said, you ready? And he goes, you know what? To be honest with you, bro, I'm not really living right. And I didn't expect to be in a situation like this with this kind of stuff at stake. And you know, I don't want to disrespect you and the Lord. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to wait in the car and I'm going to pray for y'all from the car because, you know, I didn't really expect to be. And he just ran and he went to the car. And I looked at my other friend, I said, bro, let's, let's do this. I didn't wake up that day thinking that I'd be in that situation. I don't remember in Bible college 20 years ago, reading a passage, you know, in a textbook about what to do when you confront somebody who's dealing with uh, a PTSD along with some other strongholds on the back porch of somebody's house in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I don't remember reading that, but I remember praying with my friend, hopping over this fence, and when we got close to him, I could see him. He was foaming at the mouth. He had a gun on his picnic table. And he was saying things I didn't recognize. And I began to pray. My friend began to pray. I began to pray in tongues. That's the moment when I realized my prayer language is not about doctrine. It's about survival. And you can, you can debate it all day long and you do you. But as for me in my house, if you are ever face to face with hell and all that it's bringing your way, trust me. It's amazing how all of a sudden survival becomes a thing. 
And I began to speak in tongues and pray in my language. I feel like the Holy Spirit stirred up in me. And as we got closer to him, we just started crying out to God. And I remember his eyes looking at us. They were dark. And then as we prayed, they started to change. And I remember him coming back into his right mind. We pushed this gun away and we just laid our hands on his head and prayed for him. And I'll never forget, you know, a couple months later, seeing him in church with his hands lifted. And I remember thinking, Lord, I've been the third guy in that equation before where you have asked me to step up, but I didn't realize it was that day. I didn't have it prepared in my heart to be a witness. That song, send me, I wasn't ready to be sent. And I made a decision that day, Lord, I never want to be a Christian where you put me in a position to be a blessing. But I have failed to be in your presence long enough to be filled to overflow so you can do what you need to do through me so somebody else can get to you. That is our hope today. Is that at this conference, maybe you don't leave with some methods about songwriting and leading, which I hope we get. But maybe even deeper than that, you're going to have this feeling in your heart that, man, I need to talk to the Holy Spirit more. Because that's where things change. Are y'all still with me? Because I'm starting to sweat. Why does all this matter? With my 10 minutes remaining, I might pray that it turns to 20. They can't get me off. I mean, I, I'm kidding. They can't. I hate when preachers do that. It annoys me when people come to our church and they do that. Oh, I wish I had more time. I'm like, you did have enough time. I told you exactly how long you had. You need to prepare better. Oh, wish I had more time. I told you, you had 40 minutes, bro. Prepare better. Don't make me look like the bad guy. Why does all this matter? Because without the power of the Holy Spirit, the whole faith picture is incomplete. That's where you get the rules and you get the regulations, but you get no power. That's why it's weird in our churches if we don't talk about the Holy Spirit. We can't figure out why people are coming in droves and leaving in the same amount. Because we say, come as you are. And when they get in there, we give them the rules and we give them the textbook and we give them our policies and we give them our principles. And then maybe if they're lucky, we say, oh, yeah, the Holy Spirit will help you. And we can't figure out why people come in feeling bad and they sit in churches and they feel even worse. Can you imagine if we flipped all of that and we said, hey, great to have you in church. Glad you came. Yep, we got a lot to fix. But before we go any further, you know that God is for you. You know, the Holy Spirit is in you. And there will be nothing that you face that he cannot help you overcome. There will be no sin that you get caught back up in again that he will not rip you from those clutches again and put you on solid ground. There will be no identity confusion that will get you so dark where you forget who he is. There will be no offense so strong that will keep you out of the will of God. This is the power of the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine the gates of our cities opening and people coming into church and not hearing about what they need to do to change? But before any of that, hearing about the one that is going to bring the change in their lives that they've been looking for forever. Oh, come on, somebody shout, shout me down. If you're hearing me, I know it takes more work. Religion's easy. Oh, it's easy to tell somebody the 10 things that they're wrong about. You know, it takes a little bit of faith watching somebody get to know the Holy Spirit, watching them get a conviction for themselves. If I tell you you're wrong, you're hearing it from me. But if the Holy Spirit tells you this needs to change. You heard it from heaven. It's hard to move somebody that had a revelation from God. I feel like in our culture, it hasn't been like a straight up rejection of the things of the Holy Spirit. I feel like it's been like people who have just been traumatized by bad church, bad Christian TV. Because now if you talk about the Holy Spirit, either people go on this crazy, weird extreme or they go, they're not even want to talk about it. Because they've seen one too many commercials where there's somebody on TV talking about the Holy Spirit told me to tell you to send me $100 for 100 blessings. I'm going to send you 100 napkins. You're going to wipe 100 tears. You're going to get 100 revelations. <laughs> or they've been to some sweet Christian camp as a kid where the leaders didn't know better. And someone like prayed over them to speak in some language. And it just became that yelling thing. We've all been there where, you know, like you just gave them a charity fall because you got tired of them pushing on your head. And you're just like, oh, I just can't take this anymore. And you just fell. 
speak it out. You're like, I am speaking it out. I don't know what you mean. And over the years, this kind of trauma develops into an adult that's bitter. Don't want to hear anything about it because of bad experience. Now we've thrown out maybe the biggest, most powerful piece of this whole faith puzzle which is the Holy Spirit because of bad experience. I remember when I got saved, I started reading the Bible for myself. And I asked a man in my church, he was a sweet man, he was cool. He was my boss at the time. I said, sir, how come we don't ever talk about the Holy Spirit in church? And this is deep rural Virginia, mind you. And he goes, well, Carl, let me tell you something. We do talk about the Holy Spirit, but we just kind of keep him out of the picture because he's a bit of a wild child. At our church, you know, we talk about the good Lord up in heaven. He's the good Lord. God has blessed us. Thank you for this supper. Good Lord upstairs. He's a good Lord. And we talk about Jesus. He's the lamb. He is the king. He is the alpha. He is the omega. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, you know, we try to keep him in a safe place because if you let him loose, everything gets out of control. The songs get out of control. The services get out of control. Things don't get safe. And I looked at him. I was like, that's all the stuff that I desperately need in my life. We don't need any more order. We don't need anything that makes sense. We came to Jesus because it doesn't make sense. Why would we keep the most explosive part of the faith out of our songs, out of our churches, out of our Bible? We don't need any more safe set lists. We don't need any more comfortable preaching. We need the power of God. I don't know about you, but I didn't get saved for it all to make sense. And I want to pursue more of the Holy Spirit. I'm in a city where our cool music ain't going to cut it. People are going to get saved because of our slick production, our hipster preaching. Nah, we don't care about that stupid narrative because we're in the business of watching people meet the Holy Spirit and changing because of him and him alone. And he gives gives hope to people like me. Maybe some worship leaders in here like you who you don't feel like you have what it takes. You know, I'm in in a job I don't have what it takes. But I do trust the Holy Spirit. It's amazing what the Holy Spirit can do with somebody that's willing and able to get on their knees every day and say, Lord, here I am again. If you're wondering if I'm emotionally unstable, absolutely. But I just feel it. I feel it in this room. There's people who are desperate for God to use them, but they don't feel like they have it. You don't have it. But the Holy Spirit does. That's why this matters so much. I'm going to finish, I promise. I'm just going to end it so we can pray. In just a moment, the worship team, wherever y'all are. Oh, you're there. (laughs) Not yet, though. Because the Holy Spirit is not a substitute for hard work. It's important that we say this when we teach people about the Holy Spirit. Because you have the, the other extreme of the Holy Spirit stuff where... You know, you'll ask people, you know, you going to go get a job? No. I'm waiting on the Holy Spirit. Oh, good to, good to know. You're going you're gonna to go to church? You're going you're gonna to work on the worship team? You're going to be, be a volunteer? No. It's not my season to serve. Oh. Oh, I didn't realize that you had the, the power to tell God what season it is. Isn't that cute? Isn't that sweet? I'm in a season of hiding. Oh, really? Oh, interesting. You're going to work hard at this set list? You're going to learn all the music? No, we're just going to kind of get up there. Oh, right, right, right. So that's what the Holy Spirit means. Got it. You talk to young people. You're going to study for the test? No. Listen, if you haven't studied, you can sit there and look at your exams, and you can speak in tongues all day long. Should have bought a Honda. Should have bought a Honda. You're going to fail the test. You're going to fail. You get up in front of your church and you haven't done the laboring of prep, the reverent pouring out of your soul to say, Holy Spirit, let me do all I can do because I know you're going to do all you can do. If you haven't done that, it's not going to work. 
But when you give all that you have, when you work like it's up to you, but you believe like it's up to the Holy Spirit, I believe that, that little, that little moment right there, that's where things explode. That's when lives change. I know today, you know, I've been preaching since I'm 21 years old, but I didn't get up here today and just say the Holy Spirit's going to move. No, I know this is not good enough without his blessing. It's not fair to people to get up here and just expect it to work. It's my job as a Christian man to get on my knees and say, Lord, I need you to breathe on this. I don't care how many times we've done it. I don't care how many Sundays I've led worship. I don't care how many times I've gone into this dark place to go practice music again and again and write a song that might not not even get heard by people. I'm doing it because you saved my life and I owe you the best and I'm going to leave it on this altar day in and day out. That is where the Holy Spirit shows up and changes lives. So I'm going to pray today in my 42 seconds remaining that the Holy Spirit will light a fire in you again. Because just because it's not spectacular doesn't mean it's not supernatural. We got a generation that is running after the spectacular. But the supernatural is often hidden in the mundane, in the routine, in the regular things. That's where the Holy Spirit shows up. You're not going to sit there and just hear a song from heaven. Nah, as you write 50 that nobody hears, a note, a word, the anointing out of nowhere. You're like, how did that happen? I don't know. I've just been doing what I've been doing. That is being a Christian. I remember the other day I left my house. I promise you I'm done. I'm in New York, so I have like eight closes. You got to keep people's attention. I remember I've just been praying for my kids. Love my kids more than anything in life. And and I remember just was writing a sermon and I just felt like the Holy Spirit said, go walk this out. Just go walk it out. It's part of my routine. And, and I said, son, you want to come with me? And it was snowing at this time in Jersey. It was this beautiful night. He's like, yeah, I'll come with you, dad. We're walking. And he looks at me. He goes, dad, I want to get baptized. And I go, well, son, you got to be a Christian first. He goes, am I? I said, I don't know. I don't know. Some of y'all are freaking out right now. I don't know how you talk to my, your kids, but this is how I talk to mine. I said, I don't know, bro. I said, I know that I prayed for you as a little boy, but you're 10. You know, you have a will strong enough to be disobedient. That leads me to believe. (laughs) Comes a time as a young man, you got to make your own call. He goes, well, I want to be a Christian. I said, well, well, we can handle that right now. He goes, what do I got to do? I said, well, you just, you got to cry out to God. You got to just talk to him from your heart. You got to say that you're a sinner and that you need Jesus to save you and you forsake everything else and you repent from everything else and you lay your life down and choose to follow him. He said, I want to do that. And I sat there on this curb with my son and he said this prayer. I prayed for him. We hugged. We got him signed up for the baptisms, you know, which I'm going to circumvene our system because it's my church and baptizing myself. But I sat there walking back and I'm like, I've been praying for my son for his whole life. And I had a different view of how his salvation moment might come, but isn't it just like the Holy Spirit? in the middle of this crazy, busy life for us to take a walk outside. My little boy to hear from heaven and us to have a moment that might go down in history as the most pivotal one in his life out of routine. That's not spectacular. It's just supernatural. This is the God that we serve. I'm praying for supernatural blessing over what you lead. I'm praying for supernatural blessing and grace and anointing on the songs that you write on the set list that you put together and the organization that you're volunteering. And I'm going to pray that the God of the supernatural will continue to open up your eyes and the fruit of it will be revival wherever you go. If you're hungry for that, can you stand to your feet and can you take a moment and just close your eyes for a moment? Just think about how good God has been. Think about how far he's brought you. I want you to think about these theological words, free refills. Because I don't care how bougie or fancy you are. If you go to a restaurant and you hear there's free refills, it's funny how people will break out thermoses that you didn't even know they had. But if you don't ever feel like you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, weird doctrines mess that up. When you get saved, you get it all. God doesn't withhold things from anybody, but there is a moment where you can say, Lord, I want you from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. Holy Spirit, everything you have for me, I acknowledge it. I'm desperate for it. In that moment, we believe there's a shift. 
Maybe you used to just flow in the Holy Spirit, the things of God, but it has dimmed in your life. Free rebuilds. God's not looking at you saying, yeah, I told you where you been. Work your way back up. Show me nine weeks in a row on Sunday and then we'll talk. He's the God of the new thing. If you say, Lord, fill me up again, he will do it here and now. Fill me up, Lord, till overflow. I don't want to go a moment. I don't want to lead a song. I don't want to live a day without the Holy Spirit in control. If that's your prayer, will you lift your hands high? And this team's going to lead us. And I want you to worship like it matters. Forget about where you're going. Forget about what's on your plate today. Just for a moment, can we be abandoned in the presence of the living God? So, Father, I pray that you would Renew a right spirit within us. Restore to us the joy of our salvation. May we never forget you, Holy Spirit, what you've done, what you can do, what you're willing to do in the future, Lord. I pray for fresh fire in this room. I pray for fresh grace in this room, Lord. May people write songs that you can, you can literally see lives change because of these words that are not from earth. They are from heaven. May there be anthems that come out of this conference, Lord. May there be peaceful offerings that bring people joy where they haven't had it for too long. And our hands are lifted high, Lord, not because we've given up, but because we've given in to the one that's already conquered every battle, broke every chain. And today, Lord, we give you thanks for what you've done. In Jesus' name, if you believe it, can we just give them a shout of praise? Can you clap your hands?